For tapes, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday afternoon, May the 27th, 1990. Memorial Weekend, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. Bill Noll teaches on uh, intercession, and Rod Johnson finishes the afternoon service. You know, to some of you, that's like brand new, what we've been having here this week, but to some of the rest of us, it's just like we can remember all of our lives. When it's getting better and better and good, <laughs> gooder and gooder. Amen. And it's amazing as the trotters and us have kind of been visiting a little bit together how our things of our past have, people of the past have intertwined both of our lives and, and uh, how God works and, and does things that uh, and we can set in remnants of the days of when of the glory of God in days past that has touched both of our lives at the same things. One particular instance was is a man named Frosty Foster, who I don't imagine anybody here outside of the Trotters and Irma and I have ever heard of. But uh, he got saved under the ministry of, of a minister named Ban- Banta, brother and sister Banta. And my mother and father and uh, and Jack and Irene Gibbs. And this man was a in the underworld didn't call it the mafia then uh, but uh, he was in and, and uh, quite, quite a character great big guy bigger than than Rod taller than Rod bigger than Rod cross-eyed and uh, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just thinking of the Bantas uh, she wanted so bad to to play the piano, and I guess they didn't have any pianist in the in the church. And she was praying; they were praying that. Uh, and one night, in the middle of the night, the Lord woke her up. And they had a piano in the house, but she couldn't play it. And the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, said, "Go downstairs and play the piano." She said, "I can't play the piano." The Spirit of the Lord said, "Go play the piano." She got up, went downstairs, and sat down to the piano. And the anointing of the Lord come upon her. And she began to play, and Brother Bannon got up to see what was coming off. And from that day, as long as she lived, she could sit down and play anything. Never never need to look at, didn't understand music, but she could play as good as any concert pianist that you ever heard. See what God can do? When our heart is, is to is to unto Him, that to glorify Him, then God, He gave her the desire of her heart. Not only hers, but for multitudes more. I don't know you. As a boy, you if you ever came to the camp meetings at, at, uh, at uh, uh, Lincoln and, and uh, with your dad or ever at Lincoln and, and out at uh, Petersburg, well, you would have heard her play. You probably... Oh, Anna B. Anna B. Locke was Irma's godmother. <laughs> Oh, how small the world is. How great our God is. Amen. Amen. I remember back in the days of the Dust Bowl, very few here will even know what I'm talking about, when the, the... the wind blew the dust across <coughs> from western <coughs> Texas and Kansas. And it came across Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and, and Iowa. It came across in great clouds and actually turned the sky dark in the middle of the day or turned the sky like blood red. At, at high noon, the sky it would be like blood red. And no matter what you did, you shut the doors and the windows and everything you could, and, and even when it, and you didn't open them, and even when it was gone, the house sometimes would have an eighth of an inch or more of dust on everything. 
and yet everything was shut tight. But I remember in those days when uh, nobody had any money, and uh, we lived by what we raised, we ate by what we raised, uh, poultry and meat, and uh, we burned, we burned, we couldn't buy coal, and we lived where there wasn't wood to cut, so we uh, we burnt corn for for coal. Corn was what we burnt in the in the kitchen stove and in the in the big round uh, heater. What do you call it? Huh? Yeah, the round oak heater. We burnt corn for for fuel. Yeah. Well, we never did that. Yeah, but we had. Co- but I can remember, you know, when the things were so dry and there was no water. I can remember my dad walking out across 40 acres of corn that was withered and dying, praying for that God would survive and make it, take care of it. And I can remember it raining in the middle of the night on that 40 acres of corn, and nobody else got any rain. And our corn grew, and we had feed for the cattle. And God heard and answered prayer. He sent rain when there was no rain. He sent rain when there wasn't any clouds. And he watered our corn. And we had feed. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And some of you don't understand that those days may lie ahead of us again. For God is still God. And he's the God that answers prayer by fire. And by rain, and by the earthquake, he's the God who answers prayer. And Jesus was his name. I know Brother Trotter can come up here and tell you instances that as greater, greater than these that happened to them when they were in Africa and other places. How God fed, how God took care, how He told about uh, when they held, when when God held back the rain to take His Father out uh, for. From the jungle, there was no way but God, but God. Oh, what a great God we serve. And we haven't begun to tap the resources that are ours. We're so ignorant and dumb and rebellious. Oh, God, forgive us and cleanse us and wash us. Move upon us by your Spirit, we can walk before you in that place of righteousness and holiness. For thy spirit and the angel of the Lord walks with us. And thy covering and thy protection is about us. Jesus is Lord. Holy, holy is his name. Praise you, Jesus. Irma's folks lived in those days. They sat down to eat many a time at the table and set the table and sat down to eat. Nothing to eat. Sit down. Brother Wharton would pray. Somebody would knock on the door and bring a pot of soup, a pot of stew, bread they'd baked. God supplied. Thirty-five cents, seventy-five cents in an offering to take care of a family for weeks and weeks on end. But God, but God. Today we think we've got to have so much, and we've got so much. We don't begin to appreciate anything we've got. Oh, God, thy mercy and thy grace. Thy mercy and thy grace. Jesus is Lord. Oh, where is the God of Elijah? He's in our midst. And we know it not. Oh, God, greatly is to be praised. Holy, holy is the Lord. What a most awesome thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I want mine to go before and not to follow after. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I tell you, the last two days, the glory and presence of God has been such, and is such, that it should cause us to cry from the depths of our spirit, My God, my God, my God, cleanse me, wash me, make me to be that which I cannot be except by thy blood. Show me the air of my ways. 
Convict me, O oh God, convict me. O oh God, O oh God, O oh God. There's a new day rising in the land. I can see it on the eastern horizon. Jesus is appearing to his people. Let our spirits and our hearts be open to receive that which he's bringing forth. Talking about intercession. What the Lord is requiring of his people in these hours and days. Doc's going to talk to you for a few minutes about intercession. Praise you, Lord God. First, I want to draw a picture of Moses' tabernacle. When I started about, oh, about six months ago, the pastor at my local church asked me if I would talk to the intercessory group, the prayer captains, about intercessory prayer. And so I begin to labor before God to know what to say. Because I, prayer is my whole life, and I can talk about prayer for hours on end. And so I begin to talk about first about the conditions for answered prayer. And then I begin to talk about the different types of intercessors and the art of interceding. And I looked through the Bible and I found all, I found the, the intercessors listed in the Bible, namely Abraham, Moses, Daniel, and then the great intercessor, Jesus Christ. And I begin to look into their lives and find the, the characteristics that each one had that were common and the things that were necessary for an intercessor. And I put all of this down on paper and I gave it to my people. And then one night God spoke to me and he said, look at the tabernacle. And I got up and I began to read about the tabernacle. I just began to read in the Bible. And God, as I read, he spoke to me how the priest specifically the high priest was an intercessor for the people and how everything in the tabernacle was related to intercession to coming into God's presence and today I'm going to try to relate a portion of that to you I, I told Glenn that I, I asked permission really to relate this to the morning prayer group and I intended to talk about 15 to 20 minutes and, and give them some written material and, and just sort of skim over it and, and, and hoping that I could encourage them to, to look into the scriptures. Because it's such a deep subject that I could talk from now to this time tomorrow, I think. But I wanted to see if I could give you what God gave me, a part of it. And first I want to draw a picture of the tabernacle. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the tabernacle, but there may be one or two people who aren't familiar with what Moses' tabernacle looked like. You know, uh, we said this, uh, I think Sister Linda was saying that, they, you know, that sometimes there are people who uh, you take for granted, they know something and they, they really don't. And so I, I want to take a minute or two and draw out a, just a simple chalk drop diagram and then I'll try to show you what God showed me. That's a very, that's a very crude diagram. The tabernacle has a number of, of symbolisms. It was 100, 100 by 150 cubits. That's 150 feet by 75 feet. And it was surrounded by a linen fence, which is a large square. The linen fence was seven and a half feet high. And there was a gate on the east end that was 30 feet wide. And this linen wall that went around it was made of linen, and that indicated the righteousness. Linen is always a type of righteousness. In Revelations uh, 9.18, you will find that is a scripture that, that's the basis for that. It says, linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, it separates, it's a wall, and it separates believers from the world. And the, believer, and the world is on the outside of this fence. And it's seven and a half feet. They can't see over it. And there's only one way in, and that's through the gate on the east end, and that is Jesus Christ. And if we want to come to Jesus, we have to come through this gate on the east end. And there's a linen veil that hangs down. And it has red threads and blue threads and purple threads. The red threads indicate Jesus' blood. The blue threads indicate heaven. The purple th threads are a blending of red. You mix red and blue, you get purple, and that's an indication of royalty of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so as you come through the gates, you have to come through Jesus Christ. And the first thing that you see when you come in 
is the brazen altar, and that's the B-A, the brazen altar, or the altar of brass. Now, brass stands for judgment, and it was, uh, it was seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. It was four and a half feet tall. It was a big thing, and it confronted you when you came in. Now, everybody always thought that, I always thought that everything in the tabernacle was beautiful, but there was nothing beautiful about the blade, about the brass altar. It was an instrument of death. It was big, it had fire on it, it was hot, and it was covered with blood. It was blood splattered, and there was blood poured out on the ground around it, and it was an instrument of death. Now, it indicates, it is where the sacrifice was made to propitiate, to cover the sins. Not to propitiate for them, but to cover them. And as I, as I looked at that altar, at that instrument of death, I realized then that Jesus Christ had died for my sins. He was the propitiation for my sins. Hebrews 9.11 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Jesus is the propitiation. He says, We have an advocate. First John 1 First John 2.2 2 says, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Jesus died on that, on that altar for my sins and for your sins. But he died for me. If there had been nobody else in the world, I know that he would have died for me. He died on that altar for me. And so as you come in and you look at the altar, at the brazen brass altar where Jesus died, you are confronted by the cross of Jesus Christ. You know that you cannot approach him in your sin. You cannot approach God in your sin, in your backslidden condition. You must appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you. You must appropriate to cleanse you. And once you come to the altar and you have met Jesus Christ and you've been cleansed by his blood, you stand in the court. That's, that's the court. Now, the Scripture says that you enter into this court with praise and thanksgivings. That's the outer court. That's where you stand. You can stand there and you can praise him, and he's there. But he's sort of off a little bit. But you, but you get in. You see, praise is a gate that you come in. Salvation is the wall. That's the linen wall. Isaiah says, salvation, the new Jerusalem, that salvation is my wall. And the gates shall be named praise. So you come in through praise, and you come into, that, into, the, into the outer court. But you cannot go any further until you come to the laver. Now, the laver, they didn't have, they don't know how big the laver was. There were no dimensions given for the laver. But you know what Moses made the laver out of? Anybody know what the laver was made? It was made out of brass. You know where he got the brass? The women's hand mirrors. That's right. He asked for the women's hand mirrors. They were made out of polished brass. And that is in uh, uh, Exodus 38.8. He asked for the women's hand mirrors. He made it. He put water in it. And the priest had to wash his hands and his feet between the altar, as if we, before he went to the altar to, to offer a sacrifice, or before he went into the tabernacle. And when he looked into this mirror, into this polished brass with water in it, he looked into it, he said it was a mirror. And the mirror is God's Word. As you read God's Word, you'll find that God's Word is reading you and is pointing out your sins to you. And if you want to be an intercessor, you'd better get acquainted with God's Word. And if you want to come to God in a session, remember that you must wash at the labor before you can approach the tabernacle. You must wash in the labor before you come to the altar of sacrifice. You, and you will find that in, when, you, when you get into the tabernacle, you must have been to the altar of sacrifice before you can come in, because you will need there. 
There's a need. You have to go to the altar of sacrifice. We'll come to that later. But as you wash in the labor, oh, God. Ephesians 5, 36 says that the, Jesus is coming to be washed in the water of the Word. Hebrews 10, 11 speaks of washing of the water. The Word is the water that will wash you. It will also heal you. The Word's a mirror. In James 1, 23 to 25, it speaks of the mirror, and so does 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So once you've washed in the water of the Word, then you come into the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a small tent. It was not an imposing structure. It was, uh, 40, it was 30 by 10 cubits. That's 45 feet by 15 feet, and it was 15 feet tall. It was made out of boards and had three coverings over it. And it had, a, it had an entrance on the east end, and it had a veil. The veil was linen with red threads, blue threads, and purple threads. The same as coming into salvation. Then you've got to come into the tabernacle. How do you come into the tabernacle? You come in through Jesus Christ. Who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ. You come into the tabernacle. Now, in the tabernacle there was light. The tabernacle was divided into two portions, the outer court and the inner court. And there was light in the outer court. There was a lampstand that had seven lamps on it, and it burned continually. Praise you, Lord God. It was composed of pure gold. It weighed 90 pounds. And it burned pure olive oil. It burned continuously. Uh, Exodus... Uh, 27, 20 to 21 tells you that it was a, it burned pure olive oil. It burned continuously. And Exodus 37 to, to 9 tells you that the priest tended the lamp twice a day. He trimmed the wick. He poured more oil in it. But he stopped and he tended the lamp twice a day. When did he tend the lamp? He tended the lamp before he went to the altar of incense. Before he went, on the morning and the evening sacrifice, before he went to the altar of incense, he had to tend the lamp. The, the lamp is a type of the Holy Spirit. It, it's only by the light of the Holy Spirit can you see your way once you have entered the tabernacle. On the other side is the showbread. The table of showbread was uh, oh, three feet by a foot and a half wide. It had twelve loaves, one for each tribe, in rows. And Jesus, that's in Leviticus 24, 5 to 9. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven in John 6, 48. And you can only see Jesus in the light of the Holy Spirit. And that is the bread that you must eat. Jesus said, if you don't eat my blood, my he said, if you don't eat my flesh, you have no part in me. And so as you come in, Jesus, you must partake of Jesus. Jesus must be the most important thing in your life. And then, after you've tended the lamp, you've tended the Holy Spirit. And how do you tend the Holy Spirit? Well, praise God, you pray in tongues. And build up your faith. Did you know Jude 20 says, building up your most holy faith? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Yes. Now, you want to approach God, you better pray in the Holy Ghost and get your faith built up and get closer to God. And so you come to the altar of incense, and there you're standing outside the veil. Now, this was a very special holy altar. It was made of gold. It was one cubit by one cubit square, and it was 36 inches tall. So it was about a foot and a half by a foot and a half about 36 inches tall, taller than the rest of the furniture. It had a ring around the top. And incense was offered there. It was never used for sacrifice, except once a year the high priest would come in and put, the, and put blood on the corners when he was atoning for his sin. That's the only time that blood was ever placed on it was once a year on the Day of Atonement. But it had incense on it. Now, 
That's where the priest burned incense. But to burn incense, he had to bring coals from the altar. And he burned the incense and the incense of the prayers of the saints. Now, what does all this mean? Well, it means this, brothers and sisters. You want to come before God. God lives in the Holy of Holies. Behind the veil that has been rent. And there's a way through the veil in the flesh of Jesus Christ. There stands uh, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, which contains a broken law. The, the manna of pot of manna is gone. Aaron's rod's been taken out. But the, pot, but the broken law is still there. And exactly over, and then there's another piece of furniture that sits exactly on top of it. It's called the mercy seat. It's made out of beaten gold. In one piece, it has the sharpens of God on either side. And Scripture tells you that the God of Israel but dwells between the sherubim and looks down on the mercy seat and looks down on the blood that is sprinkled. We have a bloody religion. We have a bloody religion. Blood may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to God. And that's what counts. It's the blood when he sees the blood. When the death angel came through, he passed over the houses where he saw the blood. When, G, when God looks down on the mercy seat and he sees the blood of Jesus Christ, he passes over your sins, praise God. He does not hold you accountable. One other interesting thing in the veil. It's made out of linen. It has red threads, blue threads, purple threads. But he has one other thing. Designs of cherubims. Now, what are cherubims? What are they? They are the chariot of God. Praise you, Lord. That's one scripture I want to read. Let's look at. Uh, let's look at first at Second Samuel twenty-two eleven. Second Samuel twenty-two eleven. Second Samuel twenty. He rode upon the cherubim and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made the darkness canopies around him and the dark waters and the thick clouds of the skies. And from the brightness before him, coals of fire were ended. So he rode upon the cherubim and flew upon the wings of the wind. That's your scripture, Irma, that you were talking about this morning. The uh, the second one is uh, ooh. First Chronicles twenty-eight eight, twenty-eight eighteen, and here he's talking about the construction of the cherubim in the in the temple of Solomon, and he said for the construction of the chariot, that is the golden cherubim that spread their wings and overshadowed the ark. I tell you that if you go back to Ezekiel, you'll see that the cherubims are. The chariot of God. They are the chariots of fire that carry him. Praise you, Lord. If you really want an interest, if you really want as a revelation of Jesus Christ in his pre incarnate glory, read Ezekiel with that in mind. And you'll see the pre incarnate Jesus Christ and you'll know the price he paid. For Philippians says he gave that all up. He poured all that out to be made a man, to appear in this, as a man. Praise you, Lord, oh God. So what does all this mean? Well, it means this, people. If you want to intercede, you've got to get yourself right with God. You've got to approach that, that altar, that bronze altar, that place of death. You've got to come, you've got to come to it, you've got to wash your feet and your hands in the labor and let the Word of God be a mirror to you and let it read you and let it show you what in your life God wants you to get rid of. And then you come to that altar and you lay down your body as a living sacrifice before him, which is your reasonable service, that you might know what the good and perfect will of God is. You come to the altar and then you take the coals from that altar and you walk back to the labor and then you walk into the into the into the tabernacle and you carry the coals from the altar and you stop and you tend the lampstand. You stand and you pray in the Spirit and you get down 
before Almighty God and you, and you lay your life down before him and say, Not my will, Lord God, but yours be done. Lord, what is there that you want me to intercede for today? What kind of work do you want done in the heavenlies today, Lord? Not what I want, Lord, it's not me, but what you want, Lord God. Lord, I'm not coming for myself, Lord. I'm coming to serve you, Lord. Not for myself, Lord, but for you. For I know that you will meet all of my, that you know my needs, and you will meet all of my needs of your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But Lord, let me come and let me serve you. And you take of Jesus Christ, and you take him into your life, and you come before the altar of incense, and you pick up that special incense that can be only used in one place, and you put it into the, into the blazing, into your razor, and you swing it. And your prayers will rise up before God into heaven as a sweet-smelling savor. And you stand there and you pray for the will of God. And you pray for the will of God. And then you stand and there is a time, my friend, that, praise God, he will take you into the Holy of Holies. He will take you through the rent veil. You cannot walk through of your own accord. But there is, Hebrews says that we have a way into the Holy of Holies through the body of Christ. Through his flesh we can walk in and you can stand at the foot of the altar and you can stand in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10 2, tells you that we have been raised with him, that we have been raised with him high above all principality and power in every in every power in this world and when you go into the Holy of Holies and you can stand in Him and you can speak forth the Word of God out of your lips and you know that it will come to pass because what you are saying is the will is a perfect will of God and He says when you know that you speak according to the will of God that He will hear you and when He hears you you will have what you ask for and as you ask but you ask according to the will of God for that is your divine purpose that is a purpose for which God has raised you up as an intercessor, that you might do his will, that you might command you me. Isaiah says, command you me according to the works of my hand. God wants you to command him or command him according to the will of God, that his will might come to pass. John Wesley said, the will of God will not come to pass until believing Christians pray for it to come to pass. So you come and you say, Father, use me. And you lay in, and you lay in agony before the cross. And you lay in agony before God, before it. And you look at the powers and the principalities, and they must obey you. But I'll tell you this, God will not hear a gimme prayer. Did you know that God won't hear a gimme prayer? Gimme, Lord. Oh, God, gimme, Lord, I want this. That prayer doesn't get out of the room. A true intercessor knows that God will provide for him out of all his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God expects that there are prayers in the Bible that you can pray that you know that according to the will of God. The one I hear the most is to light yourself in God and he will give you the desires of your hearts. I hear that quoted. And I say to them, have you ever looked up the Hebrew word that they translate for delight? Do you know what that word means? It comes from a Hebrew root that means to be molded by. You be molded by God. You'll desire what God desires. And he will, your heart will desire what he desires, and then he will give it to you. But be molded by him. God is not going to answer your fleshy, your fleshy demands. Praise you, Lord God. I tell you, we serve a holy God. We serve a holy and a righteous and a powerful God who loves you, who laid down his Son for you, that you might be sons of God, that you might have many, that he might have many sons. And he is raising up overcomers, people who are willing to lay down their demands of the world. He said, Be ye holy as I am holy. You're not going to be. It says, Without holiness you will not see God. Do you know what holiness means? Everything in the, in the New Jerusalem is going to be holiness unto God. Holiness means separated unto God. You know, they, when I went down the, the Colorado River, I took my kids on a float trip once, and I went down the Colorado River. And we looked down the river, and we would try to figure out how big something was. 
and we could never judge it. We could never figure out how big it was until we got there because there was no standard point of reference that we could look at. We didn't, we didn't know how, anything, how big anything was around it. There weren't any things that were standard size that we could compare it against down there where it was. And so we just had to wait till we got there. And that is what holiness is. God is holy. And there ain't nothing in this world that we can compare that against. So you don't know what holy means, but it means that you are separated from the world. That's what it means. It means you ain't walking right here. It means you getting over here or away from it where God wants you. You're not walking in, in, you're not walking in sin. I tell you, the old man is dead. But I tell you, he was crucified with Jesus Christ, but he will be resurrected if you try to walk in the world. He'll come alive. That's the reason you've got to go out to the altar, of the brazen altar, and lay it down every time you want to pray. Every time you want to do service for God, you've got to go back out to the brazen altar, and you've got to pick up some coals. That means that you've got to go out and lay it all down before him and say, God, it's all yours, Lord. I talked to you last night about laying it down. What are you hiding behind? Are you hiding behind a good job, a fine education? Are you hiding behind money? Are you hiding behind good looks? Are you willing to lay those things down for God? Remember when Moses had the staff in his hand? Moses and God said, What set you got in your hand, Moses? And he said, It's all I got left, Lord. It's all I got left. He said, you, when, when I followed you, when you told me to leave Israel, I mean Egypt, and I came out here in the desert, everything I own, everything I've got on me belongs to my father-in-law, all these sheep and everything. He said, I don't own anything except this stick that I, is my snake-killing stick, him. And he said, throw it down. He said, throw it down. And Moses said, but it's all i got left. And he threw it down. And it became a poisonous serpent. You know how I know it's poisonous? Because Moses knew it was poisonous. He fled from it. It had been an unpoisonous snake. He sort of looked at it, but it was a viper. And he told him to go back and pick it up by the tail. By the tail, Lord. Now, Moses had been out there a long time. He knew the business end was on the other end. You don't pick up no snake by the tail. But he picked it up. And it became, what did it become? It became the rod of God. Not Moses' rod anymore. The Bible called it the rod of God. And it was a rod that he carried with him through Sinai. It was a rod that he opened the Red Sea with. It was a rod he struck the, he struck the rock with. It was a rod he held up to, to defeat the Amalekites. It was the rod of God. When you throw down this thing that God tells you to throw down, he'll let you pick it up again, but it'll be his. And when you're willing to lay it down. And so you have to go to the altar and you've got to lay it all down before God. And he'll give you some coals to burn it with. And you go back in there, and on those coals, you put the incense, and your prayers will rise up before God, and he will cleanse you. And every time you pray and you read the Word, he will work in you, and you will find that you are changing, that people will say, what has happened to you? That you've changed. What's happened to you? And little by little, and precept upon precept, and time upon time, God will change you. And he will provide for you, and for your family, and for your loved ones. And I'll tell you, the intercessor is our highest calling. The intercessor is what God is looking for. And only an intercessor can enter in behind the veil to stand before the altar of God. And God is looking. Did you know that Scripture said the eyes of God search true and full over all the world to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him? So, people, I call you today to intercession. I call you to come to God, for God needs people. Our country needs people who are willing to stand in the gap against abortion, against pornography against sexual immorality, against immorality in high places. Nobody. You know, it used to be that the, when you dealt with the government, you were dealing with an honest bunch. They're a bunch of crooks. 
I mean, everywhere you read, there's corruption, and they don't even put them in jail for it. Oh, our country needs an assessor's people. I call you this day. I call you. God's calling you. The price is high, but the rewards are greater. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glenn, oh God, God told me that I would never just to give a religious lecture without offering people a chance to respond. I say to you today, if you want to be an assessor, you want God to change your life, you want God to give you a hunger, I want you to stand up. I want you to hold up your hands now. Oh, God, and receive now. Oh, God, pour out your spirit, Lord God. Oh, God, pour out your spirit. Create a hunger in your people's hearts, Lord, for your word, for your will, Lord God. Touch your people, Lord God. Touch them and draw them out, Lord God. Lord, fill them with your spirit, Lord. Lord, touch them for the call and gifts and call of God without repentance. Lord, I ask you to call them to draw them in with cords of love, Lord. Draw them in, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. I just praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord. Touch them now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Just thank you and praise you and bless you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Be the glorified, I present a living sacrifice. Be the glorified in me, holy, holy I would be, holy given unto thee. I present myself a living sacrifice. To be one with me. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, this weekend is different. It's different. And God's moving to do things in the lives of his people. And it won't only be just you here, but God's going to move on others that hear the tapes. From these meetings and he worked the same work in their lives and he's working in our lives but God is serious the hour of playing church is past but the church doesn't know that help us to be sensitive to the spirit of the Lord as it moves in our midst and that we become faithful to the calling that he's called us to. It's a high calling. It's a high calling. And we're not worthy of that calling. But his grace and his mercy is extended unto us. And we're so unworthy. We're filthy. Filthy rags before the throne. Except for Calvary. Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You know, I understand something about the veil that we don't talk about, don't hear taught, and it's hard to comprehend. But the veil was a one-piece item. But yet the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. You realize that the priest walked through the veil? He didn't part the veil. He walked through the veil. And that's why it had to be rent when Jesus at Calvary, so that it was the Holy of Holies was made available to whosoever will may come. Lord, I want to be. I'm a whosoever. Amen. But it requires holiness unto the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Well, we'll take a couple of minutes and receive the offering. And then Rod will come and pick up where he left off yesterday. Hallelujah.
What a blessing, brother. What a blessing. I approach this with utter awe. And I sit there and I say, Lord, I prefer to just sit and be fed and worship. I, uh, truly, the presence of God. This camp meeting exceeds anything of the camp meetings I've been at. I've been at a few, not a lot. But uh, the presence of the Lord is so precious. He's doing so much. And uh, just a quick couple of things that I want to mention in respect to the holiness and the beauty and the working of God. We're being brought into understanding of what true body ministry is. And I am seeing prophecy in my life being fulfilled daily. And this camp meeting again has fulfilled some, and it's exciting to see. Um, probably 12, I don't know how many years ago I met Sister Sutter. Uh, how many years have we known one another, Linda? Uh, 78, that's 12 years ago. Um, the Lord quickened to my heart and uh, that we would be ministering together. And at that time, it seemed totally out of sorts. <laughs> and my wife spoke to me, and she spoke to me as a prophetess. And she said, God has brought Linda along because you never had a brother or a sister, and you're going to learn what it is to have a sister. Now, we make fun of this a lot of times because we, 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 we truly... Um, I don't know what it's like to have a real sister, but if it's anything like I feel towards her, uh, I'm glad I don't have one. Because <laughs> she's enough to be concerned about. <laughs> but I watch my sons. My sons are willing to, to, to fight to draw blood for my, my daughter. My one, in fact, I've seen them. Now. Um, I, I, I pity the boyfriend she went out with because they... They, they gave him the works. <laughs> and uh, that's the way I feel towards Linda in spiritual things. And sometimes it gets me in hot water over there, and other times it doesn't. But uh, uh, this morning as she was being used by God, I, I wanted to stand back there and I wanted to shout glory, hallelujah, and raise the white banner of victory because of the anointing that was flowing upon her and through her. And, you better take good care of her, Dad, because I'm concerned. <laughs> you do. I know it. I'm thrilled that she's here. And uh, the Lord even confirmed that to me. But uh, <laughs> I said that with respect. You know that. <laughs> but uh, um, so there was a part of There were other things that happened that would in that area. And Brother Trotter, how the body of Christ, um, you didn't know it. And the, someone mentioned the TV program um, that you were on. I think it was Irma. Uh, the Sunday after uh, the explosion happened and uh, um, I for some reason well I know why now is the Lord was watching that program and I was at a point in life where I was uh, uh, looking up to the stomach of an ant and saying boy that's high <laughs> if you know what I mean and uh, going through some great ministry prevailing as we all do in our Christian walks because we all have a ministry. And God used you on that program in such a mighty, mighty way to minister to me. And uh, um, I said to my wife, I have such a kinship with, well, not only the organization down there, and uh, I've seen some things in the Spirit, but... Uh, with you over the TV and uh, it's as if I felt that I was going to be and then here when, when they said a, a, a brother Trotter was going to be here well I didn't know who that fellow was on the TV I just knew that by the spirit and uh, isn't that something how God brings together but also how he uses the body of Christ um, to minister to one another and uh, I, I know I'm supposed to pick up and finish uh, what I did but um, with your permission I need to just point out something here because uh, Doc was used so mightily on something and uh, um, 
turn with me. I want to show you something so beautiful I wouldn't take time. And I've preached on this a long time ago, um, but I just want to re refresh your memory. Revelation chapter... Uh, we won't get into a lot of scripture on this. Why I can't find it when I want it. Here we go. Revelation 17, 14, or 12. No, yeah, 12 to 14. And I just want to show you something um, to tell you where we're headed as Doc is... is oh, my. I, I, I'd sit under his teaching all day. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. Now, I don't, I'm not going to touch on anybody's theology. Um, quite frankly, we have a little lady up in northern Wisconsin. Um, she says, I don't want you to come in here and preach pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. She says, as far as I'm concerned, it's pan-trib. However, it pans out the way it's going to be. <laughs> and uh, honest and truly speaking, uh, um, I think I know what's right, and you're probably wrong, and I'm right. You know, that's how I feel. But uh, truthfully speaking, however it pans out, I just want to be walking today at peace with my Maker. And that's what Paul said we should do. Uh, just be prepared. Be prepared, okay? But uh, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour. Now, I want to just draw your attention to this with the beast. Personally, I believe the ten horns are in place now, but that's another subject. But I want you to see that they are receiving power as kings. Kings stand for authority, and they are with the beast. This means that they are representing a united force with the beast system, with the system of the world, with the world can be called Antichrist system if you want it. Um, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now the New Age movement cannot work effectively unless the people come together and are of one mind as they meditate and dwell on things of psychic realm power that they call supernatural power. Um, Everything is coming together, okay? Um, and they are surrendering their authority or power and strength. They say, we are we see receiving strength from a God. They don't know which God it is. It's the B-system God. All right? Now, look at verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. Now, remember who the Lamb is. The Lamb is Jesus Christ, and Christ is where today, but sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and He is sitting in victory today, and He has assigned His church to be the tool to go through to the victory. Hallelujah. To manifest the victory in this world, because creation originally was such that man lived with authority of a free will and had dominion over everything untainted by sin. They have one, uh, or these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Hallelujah. Who's going to overcome them? The Lamb is going, the Christ, the authority and the power of the Christ that is coming forth in the church shall overcome them. Hallelujah. It's made up of overcomers and conquerors. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. That tells me that he is going to come with an authority to go into battle. That shows when, he, when I see Lord of lords, I immediately think of a master. And when I think of a master, I think of servanthood. And he is going to, he is going to be using a people who are true servants. And to be a true servant, you've got to be a true intercessor. You've got to learn what Doc taught just a few minutes ago. Hallelujah. And those that are with him uh, will recognize him also as king of kings. Now, a king dictates authority and sets up the rules of the kingdom. What kingdom is he in charge of? Heaven. And establishing it here. 
So he's bringing heavenly rules to drive out the force of darkness. Hallelujah. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Sunday afternoon, May the 27th, 1990. Memorial Weekend, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. Bill Noll teaches on uh, intercession, and Rod Johnson finishes the afternoon service. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. So he's bringing heavenly rules to drive out the force of darkness. Hallelujah. And the people that are marching with him are recognizing by their actions, not by their mouths, but by following him and living under the authority of his kingship. Hallelujah. We know it, but I just, you know, I, it's good. <laughs> now, I want you to see who's with him, and then I'll be still on this subject, because I'm supposed to finish what I started. But, uh, okay, the, those that are with him, it says, are called, are chosen, and are faithful. Isn't that right? Here is the gate, uh, the door. No, the gate, the gate. <laughs> And there, there's a scripture uh, where, where Jesus says, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, and many or few are those that come. You know, you know which one I'm... Few there, few there be that find it. When you become born again, you enter into the gate. But now Jesus is teaching later on with the disciples, and he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Well, the called are the ones that come here. But then there is a group of Christians that, and that word chosen is a feminine word. Um, and of course the church is feminine. If you study Isaiah and so forth, uh, you'll find that this is representative of the church, the chosen is. And it says, the many and called are few are chosen. And Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, I've always used that as a salvation scripture, but in reality it's not. He's standing at the doorway here of the tabernacle, and he's knocking, and he's saying to the outer court Christians, he's saying, will you open the door and let me come in and draw you in to me? For it's Jesus that draws us to him. Hallelujah. So, the called and the chosen is a qualification to march in war with him. But there's one more qualification, and that's where the intercessory prayer comes in. I pray I'm not confusing you. I don't want to get off. But it says that you must be faithful. The, the, the thing, meaning of faithful means to have the God kind of faith, the fullness of the faith of God. And the, that means that I must enter into a place where under all circumstances and any circumstances, I will obey the commands of God and have complete faith and trust in God that He will get me through whatever situation I am in. I have absolute, that word absolute keeps ringing in my ears by God. He wants me to be in absolute submission unto Him. He wants me to move absolutely only when He calls me. He wants me to stand until He absolutely says you may sit. Hallelujah. And absolute comes here as we enter into the presence by intercessory prayer and, and, and so forth. Do you follow me? Oh, glory to God. Woo! We're headed to victory. 
But it's not going the glory way of flesh. It's going the glory way of crucifixion of the flesh. Jesus went by crucifixion of the cross. Do we think we're greater than Jesus, that we should have our flesh and walk into the glory of God? There's no way. Hallelujah. Oh, what a privilege it is. What a privilege it is. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. No, I need to, I need to shut that chapter. I could go on until 10 o'clock tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Let me show you one other thing. Brother Glenn, please, you understand. I know you do. Uh, 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 you know, there's, uh, and this goes with deliverance. We'll incorporate this with deliverance. Uh, I don't know how, but the Lord will do it. <laughs> so, look at Revelation. Uh, again, I'm not going to touch a new theology, I don't think. Revelation, uh, where am I? 15 or 14, verse 12. You know, as you go through deliverance, sure I am. Praise the Lord. He knows what he's doing. I just don't know what he's doing. But I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I scribbled this down. i got to find where I scribbled it. Well, I'll do it for a minute. All right. In order to enter into true communion with God. Boy, Doc, I'm so glad you did this. Can I just quickly say one fast thing? While I was fasting and praying about what to, to share at camp, one of the things the Holy Spirit spoke to me was, bring the tabernacle teaching along. And I got it sitting up there. And I said to Glenn, I should almost run and get the, the overhead for Doc so he could put it up there to minister from. The, but uh, it's the word for the hour. Yes, yes. It is. And um, we're, we're doing a lot of teaching on that now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, anyhow, one of the requirements to enter in to this place is that we need to be in a pure state before God. Now, in my flesh, I cannot be in a pure state. Isn't that right? Uh, my, my, my righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah said it, and then uh, I think it was Isaiah, and then Paul repeated it later on. I am an unclean vessel. Now, that can be a very depressing thing if I, th if I dwell on it. But I can rejoice in this fact, and this is part of deliverance, that Jesus Christ is my righteousness, and we dare never forget this. In Zechariah chapter 3, and I shared this with a brother again last night, it says that I am a brand plucked out of the fire. I have the filthy garments removed from me. All right. And, and, and uh, those garments are seen by Satan as filthy yet. Uh, and he accuses me as the accuser of the brethren. However, that's all he can do is accuse me. So part of deliverance and maintaining your deliverance is that we must come and bring the righteousness of God, hallelujah, that he has provided, which is the blood, and present it to that area where we have curses in operation and where deliverance is needed. Then the process of walking it out, and that's where I'm going to get to this scripture. Um, the steps of, of walking it out are found in the fruit of the Spirit, in a portion of them. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, to me, is the divine nature of God in action. Do you follow me? Yes. And uh, no matter how hard I try to fake it, nope, you cannot do it. You know that? In every fruit of the Spirit, you can be successful at faking it for a while. It's something you cannot teach. The fruit of the Spirit comes by prayer and living. And it comes through repentance and obedience. Amen. That's the only way it comes. I may be able to love many people with the love that should be of Christ for a period of time. 
But, but you know that when at home, when great pressure comes, no matter how much you love your mate, we reach an explosion point. And have you ever said to your mate, please don't push me so far. You're pushing me past the bre breaking point. One of the ground rules of counseling of marriage is to learn where the breaking point is in one another and when to back off. <laughs> All right. Remember that. <laughs> But uh, but 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 uh, the nature. <laughs> My wife reminds me of that frequently. <laughs> but the nature of Christ is that it loves unconditionally, no matter what the conditions are, and it never fails. It's an eternal love that is continuously based on seeing the best and forgiveness. Hallelujah. So you see, uh, we cannot take it when pressure gets great. Likewise with the rest of the fruit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit that, that are required in deliverance is this. Once you have repented and made yourself right with God, and we go to our brother's message last night, ask, seek, knock, in that area of breaking the curse. And there's many scriptures that say we are a new person. We won't have time to get into them. But then we come to the point of going home and walking it out. And this is where my cry is for you today. I, I, I'm crying to God and saying, give me the ability to encourage them to be equipped to walk in victory and not have to ever come back and, and pray for deliverance in whatever area that is again, or to ever break that curse again. All right? Because it's at the point when I fail, when I go home, that I become discouraged, and I become downtrodden, because I'm not in the fellowship of the saints of like kind, and I don't have the ministering power of the Holy Spirit of many of you, where, where, where we have the legions of angels ministering that we have here. You know, and that's why we say we go from a mountaintop to a low experience after times like this. And uh, the glory of the Lord is home is just as much as home as it is in here. But it's manifested in a greater portion because we are dwelling together in unity. And we're obeying God as we forsake not the assembling the cells of ourselves together. And we're exhorting one another. We're edifying one another. That's why we have this tremendous power and victory as we come come together, and that's why we need it. But we need to carry it with us. We need to carry it with us. The first thing that we learn is that we need to learn the fruit of long-suffering. And if you want to take time, but don't lose revelation, because I'm going to get to that as the last scripture, Colossians 1, 9 to 11, probably could sum it up as quick as any. You know, the Apostle Paul teaches intercessory prayer in Colossians chapter 1, and it's a model that we should all follow. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And now look at this. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. What? Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Hallelujah. It is a command from God, and it is a walking it out process that we must recognize is not condemnation. But it is actually on the road to victory. And because we have the mind of Christ when we're born again, isn't that right? And because the Word says, I'm a new creation, and I am truly, I have the privilege of speaking to the accuser, Satan, and say, accuse me if you have to, but I refuse to accept the accusation because I have the attitude of Christ that says I'm going to walk through this experience with joy. And that's how we learn the secret of Nehemiah saying, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
It came after broken repentance by the people. And he said, it's time to get up and to rejoice and feast and know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. 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 And true repentance it starts here as we're born again. But we learn what true repentance is when we approach the most holy place of God, which is the presence of God, and we realize like Isaiah did, Oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. And we run back here and we cry out to God, Cleanse me. And the angels of God touch our lips with the coals of fire. And only then can we enter in to the presence of God and be as Isaiah and say, Here am I. Send me, send me. And send me, send me is bring me closer to you, God. I, thought, I always thought that send me, send me was something glamorous calling in the flesh. It's not. Send me, send me is lift me higher. Lift me up into your glory. Oh, let me ascend where Moses received the law, that I might hide from your face, but know and bask in the presence of your glory. Hallelujah. And that comes by lying flat before him. As Moses worked laboriously to climb that mountain, so do we work laboriously to lie that he might increase. Hallelujah. I didn't know I was going to preach. Let's go to the last one, patience. In verse 12 of Revelation chapter 14, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, to set the scene for you just very quickly, the prior verses talk about Babylon has fallen, and Babylon has fallen, and the wrath of God is being poured out. We have a promise from God in Romans and in, in, in Thessalonians that the wrath of God will not be poured out upon his saints. Okay. Now, there is a scripture, and we'll not take time to look at it, but there's a scripture in Revelation, I think it's 12, but I'm not sure, or 7, but it says that the saints in the outer court are going to be trampled over by the Gentiles, okay? And the Gentiles there are symbolic of they're going to be overcome by the power of the sin in the world and the persecution against the church. Now, the system here of Babylon, which is the church system, has been overthrown by the wrath of God. And it's overthrown because people, and it's happening now, have looked to the church. They have looked for the power of God in the church system, and it has failed miserably. And it's God allowing it to fail so that purity can come forth out of it. Oh, there's so much here. But that's exactly what it is. And, and as these people are being trampled over, um, they're not trampled unto death, but it means they're being held down, that they cannot worship, they cannot have the fellowship, and they want more. And, and uh, well, they may be forced into death, but that's another subject. But there is a group of people then that have got a calling at this time. And here is the patience of the saints. What do they do? They keep... The commandments of God. Isn't that right? Number one, they keep the commandments of God. A command of God is to be holy. Yes. To be holy means to be set free of all impurities within. To be set free of all impurities comes only through deliverance. The Lord says he searches your hearts. He tries the reins. We read last time how our heart is desperately wicked. But I want us to see that patience is a time period when God is going to search our hearts, and He's going to try our hearts, and He's going to send the hornets in to the heart, and He's going to drive out things that we don't know are there, except that we know that things are not right and we don't have perfect peace with God. All right? And we're searching and we're saying, God, what's wrong in this area of my life? What's wrong in that area of my life? And that's where the beauty of the deliverance ministry comes in. 
And that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in. And it convicts you under the deliverance ministry. Or a word of knowledge points it out. Or so on and so forth. But then there's the patience of walking it out. Of walking it out. And it's going on while the wrath of God is being poured out. Now you're sealed at this time, so you have nothing to worry about. You're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll show you that in a second as we bring this about, and we'll have deliverance with it, I'm sure. And they keep the faith of Jesus. Who are the ones that marched in war that we read about? The ones that are full of the faith of Jesus. And the saints are the ones that, that, that are being tried in their patience area are the ones that maintain the faith in Jesus. It's not an absolute statement of they have the faith of Jesus and it needs not to be fed anymore. Because the principle of God's word is faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's a growing experience. Is that not right? We'll attain the fullness of faith someday. But not at this point. All right. Now, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. And that always puzzled me. I thought, Lord, how can I be dead and die? Contradictory statement in the natural. And uh, especially be blessed. To me, being blessed is, is not, is not de being dead and dying. <laughs> and the word blessed means full of joy and happiness. And at peace with God. To be dead and die in the Lord says this. Oh, I missed something. Well, that's all right. Are the dead which die in the Lord, for they, they are the ones that cease from their labors. They rest from their labors. Now, Hebrews, in chapter 5, I believe it is, speaks of the rests of God. But this is not that type of a rest. This word rest means have entered into the times of refreshing to be re-strengthened to go on. It's like a break in work. Hallelujah. Glory. So the work is not finished yet. It's a progressive rest that we, that we get as we come into here. And there's a protection that goes with it. And it brings deliverance. And then it says that progression goes on their works that are, do follow them. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 and on, it talks about our works being tried in the fire. And we'll not lose our... We better read that as, as I bring things to an end here. I don't know if I made any sense to you this afternoon or not. But look at me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You've been fed so much good and, and you're being brought into such heights. Um, I can only pray that this will give you strength as you go. Amen. But I want you to see something here to carry with you. Now, the works that they were talking about there are pure works. And here's what the pure works are. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every works, man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Fire is the purging of God. The purging of God is going to, is started to fall already, but it is refining and driving away anything of flesh that I do that's not of the command of God. You follow me? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And if you study the Great Tribulation, I may as well throw it in, it falls on the church that's an overcomer, but not successful. The Great Tribulation does. Not the wrath of God, no, but the great tribulation does. And those that survive are the ones that are in the Spirit, totally protected. Hallelujah. And, and how you choose to, to interpret that doesn't matter. The important thing is that you're above the conditions of the fire. But now as you, it says in verse 14, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Let me ask you something. What greater reward can you receive than to be in the perfect presence of Jesus Christ? 
That's the reward. I don't give two hoots and a holler about golden crowns, quite frankly. I'm going to cast them at Jesus' feet if I would get one, because I don't deserve it. It's by the grace of God that I even got saved. All right. But to me and to you, the greatest reward that we can have is to come here, hallelujah, into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, and nothing of flesh can enter in there. And the only way you can reach that is through intercessory prayer and deliverance and being set free. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Now, the last verse that I'll bring you is this. You saints rejoice while we're being purified. Because the next verse says, If any man's work shall be burned, and I've got so many that have been burned at a Christian school, I thought it was the most valiant religious thing I could do. I love kids, 30 some of them. The business was putting more than half of them through school. On and on. It looked like it was a great banner, you know? And what an ugly experience it turned out to be. Almost Anyhow, I mean, the, the, the fruits of it were rewarding to me. But when we brought it to the Lord and we just interceded in tongues one night, God shut the school down within a week and He said, It is a work of your flesh. I mean, that was a tragic experience. And I could go on and on with stories like this of what me thinks me should do. But in the good religious works, but the proof is in this. When the pressure comes in the fire of God, we don't lose our salvation. Our works are burned. But by he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Hallelujah. So, as, as we enter in, as we enter into the Holy of Holies people, we become valiant warriors worthy only by the blood of Jesus to stand in the presence to do warfare against the Antichrist system, which is all spiritual warfare. It's not foot warfare, it's spiritual warfare. And we enter in here and all of our fleshly, what me thinks, make no difference. Only hearing the voice of the King. Only hearing the voice of the King. Hallelujah. Out here is my emotions. This is my, my, my soul realm, if I can put it there, where I can be attacked. I've got the power of the Holy Spirit here. I speak in tongues here. I got that when I broke through. But I still don't have the victory, and I go back out here and I waver back and forth. And I pick up harassing devils, or my iniquities overtake me at times. And that's where we need the deliverance that we're getting here. And until I am dealt completely with on them, I cannot enter in to the presence of God to do warfare. There's another scripture in Revelation that says we're going to be beheaded. I often wondered how I'd be any good to God being beheaded. And what he really says there is, it's not this one. There's going to be some that are already. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I hope I don't have to go through that. To be beheaded is to have my way, my authority, become his authority. Hallelujah. That's what it means to be beheaded for the cause of God. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Now, there's two things, and I'm going to wrap this up right now, but if I stick to my notes, I can do it with much better. That as I'm really running into in the area of deliverance that I want to draw your attention to as we close, in their roots, and they're destroying the world and America and the church, if they can. And you have to have deliverance to get rid of them. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 41 to 43, take my word for it now to save time, it talks about roots coming from gall and wormwood. Gall and wormwood stand for drugs and alcohol. And Isaiah 47, 12 to 15 tells us that those that partake of that 
bring a curse upon them. Those, and if you trace that, the, the drugs and alcohol, you can trace it from Genesis through Revelation, and it is a curse that is evident to destroy the land. I think I did a teaching here once on it, if I remember right. But anyhow, and Gall and Wormwood in Numbers chapter 15, verse 30 and 31, are presumptuous sins. In other words, they are sins that man knows better to do, but he willingly rejects the voice of God and says, I'm going to do it. Now, we've got to remember that we suffer sins from our forefathers. So you take the drug situation, and babies are being born today drug addicts. Isn't that right? And, but it's because parents have willfully rejected the call from God. Now, I personally believe that we shouldn't blame the government. We need to blame the church for becoming weak-kneed. And under the control of the spirit of Jezebel, which says, Do it my way rather than do it God's way. So instead of us blaming Satan for the conditions that we're living in, it has to come about for God to set up his kingdom. I rejoice on that end. But in reality, it was us or our ancestors that failed by not going into the presence of the Holy of Holies. They became lazy and they got happy with just the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the outer court experience, and they didn't stick to the righteousness of God. And so people were forced to go to get their answers someplace else to escape the pressures of the world. The pressures of the world can be escaped by going into the presence of Jesus. But what do drugs and alcohol do? They lift you up into a euphoria that takes you away from the pressures. One young man on cocaine I'm working with now, he says, I take cocaine because it makes me feel important. Another one tells me I don't have to think about the ugly things going on at home. And on and on it goes. All right. That brings a curse upon us. The other one is bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, I think it is, talks about bitterness as a root. And bitterness comes from anger not dealt with, if I want to wrap it up in a hurry. And anger comes from situations where we lack communications with one another. Isn't that right? And lacking of communications takes place because, again, we don't have the love of Christ ministering to one another. Some of the ways that this bitterness root has crept in, and see if this doesn't minister to you as we wrap this up. Church family. Boy, I'm running into this more and more and more. I was the victim of it for a while. You get bruised by a group of believers. And, and instead of recognizing it as a growth experience, you let it minister defeat to you. I don't see the Christ in it. I wanted to share, and maybe we will, on the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord was with Moses when Aaron and Miriam turned on him. And it was the glory of the Lord that ministered that Moses was right and settled the church dispute. So we need to see in our brother and sister relationship in the family of God the glory of the Lord. We better find out whether we're Arian, Miriam, or Moses, and then listen to the voice of God, whichever one we are. But let me tell you what's happening. Bitterness is creeping in because we don't know the power of God to deal with it. And we try to control it ourselves. And that's the Jezebel spirit. Family relationships is another area. And part of the rebellion of this age is because dad won't be dad. And he's forcing mother to be dad. You hear me, man? The awesomeness of the calling and the privilege of being a man is so great that we have to live at the Holy of Holies. If you're going to fulfill your position where God would have you to be the head of your house, whether you be single or married... It's awesome. I try not to get emotional on that because it's such a vast subject, too. But hear me out. 
And because the man has fallen down and given in, the woman has had to assume roles that are not of her, not assigned to her by God. And instead of her having the example of the husband turning to God, she should turn to God at a time like that. But the chaos of the hour and the spirits that are running rampant cause her to turn to other things, and she controls the situation in the home. She wasn't designed by God to be the authority in the home. The man was. And she was designed to be a helpmeet, one fit to work with the authority in the home. So the children rebel. It has to be. I could never have run a trucking business the way we think we can run our homes. I've been bankrupt in a week. Another area. Huh? Yeah. Another area is sins of uncleanness. Goodness sakes, really, I'm, I'm, I'm closing. It's ten after. But the unclean sins are the sexual sins that are going on. I'm working with a man right now who caught his children, age 18, 17, 11, and 9, playing doctor. I'm being nice as I say this. He disciplined his children, and they should have been disciplined. His children, nine-year-old, went to Boys Cub Scouts the next day and said to the leader, Boy, my dad really woke me last night. He's freaking out. Cub Scout leader undressed them and checked for bruises, couldn't find them, but became alarmed, called school. The school watches the child for two weeks, couldn't really find anything other than this little fellow at age nine had a persuasion to tell stories. He had a spirit of lying about him. Needed to be delivered by his dad. His dad didn't know deliverance. Made up some stories. Social service was called in. Social service had just hired a lady who was abused by her father. This lady had a vendetta against men. She immediately, without investigation, told the children what to say. The 18 and the 17-year-old daughters had their pride injured because they were caught turned on their dad. The man is in jail. I led him to the Lord. I'm in the process of, uh, he was, I can't go into all the details, but he was turned on by his lawyer and it's a mess. But he, and he's living under the threat of serving a long time in prison for disciplining his children. Now, what's happening in his home is this. I become a big father or a grandpa to those two boys whenever I'm home. And uh, they've accepted the Lord, repented of their sin, and they're willingly going to the court system to testify they lied. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to one other thing of how sick things are in the area of family and uncleanness and so forth. It's happened because there is so much incest going on today, and, and there is so much promiscuity and the freedom of it. Now, well, because we, we live in an area where we don't have a church per se, we get a lot of people that say, I want to get married, and when I, it's a good opportunity to lead them to the Lord. But do you know what their excuse is? The latest one was, we want to get married. We've been living together for three years, and yes, I'm pregnant, but that's not the reason why. We saved enough money to build a new house, so we feel we're ready to get married. And they think it's a matter-of-fact way of life. That's where the moral decay has entered. This will fit into deliverance in a minute. But to finish the story, this little nine-year-old boy um, was reprimanded by his mother in front of me. And he said, I don't have to listen to you, mother. And she caught herself and she said, that's right, he doesn't. Well, I could tell you many other stories like this. So I reprimanded the kid. <laughs> I figured... <laughs> I'm not going to sit back and let any little kid do that. No way. He knows I love him. And afterwards he cried and he said he was sorry. But he had a hard time sitting down for a couple minutes. And I could have got thrown in for that too, but he knew I love him. And I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you that's where it at. And uh, by the way, he hasn't skipped school once since we brought him to the Lord. And that's three months ago. And I'm so excited about that because now he and I get to go on a fishing trip together. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, another area is in our vocational area. Things happen in our jobs where we let our feelings, so to speak, get hurt. 
We need to let Christ show and not be so concerned. We need to work unto Christ with that attitude all the time. Let that be with you. And uh, then bitterness creeps in, oh, so much, from not forgiving self and not forgiving others. I, I, I've just scraped the surface, but I wonder if we haven't hit home with some of them. Huh? Have we hit home? I know we have. We're carrying hurt. I can see it on some faces out there even. The answer is to come here and not be a phony. Jesus said, quit being a Pharisee and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. You'll keep your deliverance and you'll go on to victory if you have a sincere repentance. Peter had two types of faith and repentance. The first was Jesus I'm convinced in my heart that I will go all the way for you. The second was the pressures came and he couldn't go all the way for Jesus. And he went out and had true repentance. He wept bitterly and he went on silently to be called by God to preach one of the greatest revival sermons there were. But you know where he wept bitterly? He wept bitterly right here. We're used to a cheap salvation here. Confess your sin. We're more interested in getting 500 souls so it looks good in our roles to say I'm sorry or in our zeal to lead someone into Christ. We force them into repentance and we say, if you just say you're sorry for your sins, Jesus will come into your heart. And that's not true. That's a lie. And we're opening ourselves up, as Sister Sutter said this morning, we open ourselves up to the psychic realm. You know that feeling of getting saved that happens to a communist when they join the communist party many times. It's a euphoric, satanic. That's bow our heads. God have understanding. Lord, we not apologize for things. We accept them that we walked in your will, but we don't understand and it's your business. Would there be any here this afternoon that have been convicted by the Holy Spirit in the Word of God, and you've not really had a true repentance before God. You've probably prayed the Prince Sinner's Prayer. You may be even speaking in what you think is tongues, but you've never had a true brokenness over the sin in your life. You've never really wept before God and said, God, I don't care what the price is. Separate me unto you that I might be full of the faith of God. Quickly raise a hand. That's right. There's more. I know there is. Come on. You've been brought into cheap Pentecost, I call it. Cheap salvation. You've been robbed. You've been stolen from. That's right, brother. The Holy Ghost is working on you. There's some more. Shalata Bariyanda. Ah, that's right. You've never really been broken before Jesus. And I'm looking up to you with courage that say, yes, that's where I was. And I'm saying, to God be the glory and the power of the Holy Spirit is coming on you now. How many of us haven't proclaimed as Peter did? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And we've walked on and we've been pressed where we've had to stand up for Jesus or deny Jesus. And the pressure has been so great that we've denied and through our actions of sin, whether they be controlled or not, right now I'm not concerned about. But through the actions of that sin, we have said, I deny you, Jesus, by acting in Satan's way. I need true repentance in that area of my life. I'm dealing in an area here where you're fighting with particular sins in your life, where they're harassing you continuously, and they're out of control at times, at times you can control them. It's like an aspirin with a headache. How many are here this afternoon that would say, I've got areas in my life like that, and I need to deal with them. Come on, lift your hand if it is so. Oh, I dare say we probably all would have to. Come on, don't lie before God. But don't do it because I said it. Let it be the Holy Ghost convicting you. Otherwise it's soul ties, and I don't want it. I'm sick of that cheapness. How many others would say, yes, God? Demonic oppressing, possession, 
flesh that's secondary right now the real thing is it's there and it needs to be dealt with and I am to the point God where I'm like Peter I'm going to go weep bitterly because I hate it and I'm going to take it to that altar how many more would say that's where I am let's stand together Hola tabari andala na basia, hala kari andala na basia mala shari anda, hano lolo basia, hallelujah. I need a saint that's a lady that has discernment of spirits to come here. Come on, there's one here in the body of Christ. There has to be, huh? Please, I would like you to take that lady. Thank you. I just keep calling on you. My wife's not with me, and I, I need, I need help. Young man, I, I've got a love for you, and you know it. We'll talk in a minute. All right. You're a precious brother, and, and, and you don't need to live under them conditions you do anymore. You're going to be free in just a little bit. Just be patient. The rest of us that raised our hand, I want you to pray with me right now but don't you pray because I'm leading you in it you pray because your heart is rent before God you're broken before God you're convicted by the power of the Holy Ghost otherwise you're so tied to me in the emotions of this situation and I'm sick of it I want don't want that with you let's pray Dear God, I ask that you would work by the miraculous power of your Holy Spirit. The cry of my heart is that we would just lay before the altar and weep until we have completely released. And Lord, it's not possible right now. You know conditions. So I'm asking you, God, to work a godly sorrow in these people. They have come and with an openness, oh God. We didn't plan on this meeting turning out this way. But as you have led it this way, now, God, we bring to you our godly sorrow. And, Lord, even though it's not the way we think it should be, I'm asking for a conviction, a repentance, and a true conversion, and a hate for the sin to fill the people and to be replaced by the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, we come that way now into your presence. Pray with me. Dear Father, here I am. I stand naked before you. I truly desire to be changed. I want a pure nature. I want to be delivered from all uncleanness. Father, set me free from these sins. And you say them to yourself and the Father. Father, I have confessed these sins unto you. I ask you to cover them by the blood of Jesus. I desire to stand clean and pure. I receive the forgiveness by your grace because of the power of the blood. And I thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for me. Because now I stand free. I truly am a brand plucked from the fire. You cannot touch me, Satan. I refuse to acknowledge you in that area. I am a new creation. With the mind of Christ. Father, help me live with the mind of Christ attitude. It is ultimate victory. And as I walk to that victory, help me to dwell upon things that are pure, that are lovely, and of good report. 
Minister heavenly things to me, Father. Remind me that I sit with you, Jesus, in the heavenly places, above the authority of Satan. Fill me with your spirit of joy and strengthen me in my patience area and minister to my faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. amen. I pray to God that the areas that we called out, and this is not real type deliverance that we're used to, but you were touched by a conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's where deliverance is at. And as we brought it, I want to pray with you. Should I close for dinner? Good. I'll turn this off. There has just been a phone call received. A brother, Frank Edwards, who is known to the camp meeting people here, has just suffered a major heart attack, and they're looking our way for prayer. you believe God can answer? Do you believe God will answer? Hallelujah. Brother Johnson, let's just agree together right now. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead. Lead right on. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the word salvation that sums up healing, that sums up deliverance, that sums up reconstruction, that sums up totalness in you. We present this brother to you in this hour, Lord, and we ask that you would bring healing to life in his body, Lord, that you would heal his heart and strengthen it, O oh God. Would you cause his faith to swell, that he would sense the presence of the healing power of God, and that he would grab the hem of the garment, O oh Lord, and that he would flow into the healing power, and that he would be free from anything of that heart attack. In Jesus' name we proclaim it. Hallelujah. 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 Uh, I don't know if there's a couple of men that could would do this, but I would like for a couple of you, I don't care who you are, from, we go down through the camp and invite everybody to service tonight. Two of you go together. Uh, down through uh, all the people, down through the camp room. Uh, would uh, you in the plaid shirt and the gentleman behind you, you two, would, would you mind doing that? You two. I would appreciate it very much if you would go call on everybody and invite them 7 o'clock to the service tonight. Father, we thank you for the food that's prepared for us. Make it health and strength. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that's flowing through this place and for the, the presence of the Lord that is present here and will be present as we gather back this evening to glorify thee and to hear the word of the Lord uh, de declared in our midst. Amen. Amen. Glory, Zion is a place of singing. Zion is a place of joy. Zion is the glory of the Lord. Zion is a place of mercy. Zion is a place of praise. Zion is the glory of the Lord. So let us climb the hill of Zion to the city of the living God. City of the living God. City of the living God. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.
Thank you.